Good morning, everyone. Welcome. My name is Leah, um, and I'm Gary's daughter. Today I'll be teaching the class on how to grow seeds, how to store them, harvest them, and germinate them. Um, so we'll start with what is a seed? Um, the seed is a result of a fertilized flowering plant that is capable Oh, yes, <laughs> capable of germinating to produce a new plant. Um, and there's thousands, billions of different types of seeds, and they're very important to us. Um, the purpose of the seed is to replace the parent plant to further ex its existence and continue growing. Um, so I guess I'll start with germinating because um, that's very important. Um, the, there are a lot of different methods to germinating the seeds. Um, the first one I'll talk about is scarification. So scarification is the method of breaking into the seed coat. If it's a really hard or waxy seed coating covered, then <clears throat> sometimes seeds need help um, getting into the surface. So, so or the water to in, get into the surface. So um, some ways that we can help the seeds is by using uh, like sandpaper. Sandpaper. So um, I'll show you like one type of um, scarification is cutting into the seed. So this, does anyone know what this seed is? Yeah, a mango seed. And um, sometimes they are able to break free naturally, but usually they need a little bit of help opening the surface. So when I, after I eat the mango, I use my pruners to cut open the outer layer. Whoops. So this is the inside of a mango, and this is the seed. So this is the seed coat, and that's the seed inside. And since this is a tropical fruit, the seeds don't, aren't very viable for long. So mango seeds you want to plant right away um, and make sure that they don't dry out. So some people store them in like a plastic bag with a paper towel or water. Um, to keep it moist and humid until they plant it. Um, when I take it out, I just put it straight into a pot, maybe a little bit bigger than this. And then I plant it sideways like that because the stem will come out one side and the roots will go down the other side. So when it grows, it'll pop up a stem sideways. I think so. I've done that before too. You can plant it either way and eventually they do find their way up, but I think it, it's a little faster when you plant it sideways because then they're right there by the surface. And the rule for most seeds when you bury them, you want to cover them the same thick, the same, like as much as they are thick, if that makes sense. So like this is about maybe half an inch to an inch thick. So I would cover it with about half an inch to an inch of soil. So if they're like really tiny seeds, like broccoli seeds, you just barely cover those about like less than a quarter, about an eighth inch. Um, but some will make it if the soil's loose, 
and moist, then it's easier for the seed to germinate through the soil. So as long as they're not like, like three inches deep, then they'll be fine. Um, so then after you plant like a tropical seed, you'd want to keep it moist um, and don't let it, any seeds really dry out until they germinate and sprout up. And then you know that they're alive. Um, another um, way to scarify is acid or alcohol. Um, people soak them in like alcohol to kind of loosen the seed coat um, or scratch the surface. Sometimes like cherimoya seeds, you can give it a little nick with your pruners um, and then at the very tip and that also helps the water imbibe into the seed. Uh, probably rubbing alcohol, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any questions on scarification? Okay. Next one is So next one is stratification, and that is using um, uh, breaking the seed out of its dormancy. So like uh, cold stratification and heat stratification. Um, cold, for example, would be refrigerating stone fruits or apple seeds, things that need to go through a winter in order to wake up and germinate. And then heat stratification would be like fire, like naturally in native, uh, native plants, they sometimes a fire goes through the land where they are growing and kills all the mother plants, but the seeds have been in the soil and the heat um, breaks that seed coat and breaks their dormancy and allows them to grow that way. Um, any questions on s stratification? Okay. Another method is soaking the seed in water. So a lot of seed packages will say to soak your seeds in water for like 24 hours. Um, that's also to help them imbibe, and which imbibition means the seed is uptaking water so that it can start growing and the nutrients get hydrated um, inside the seed. So soaking seeds is a method to help them get started faster. Um, but honestly, I just plant, even if it says to soak the seeds, I just plant them in the soil right away and just keep the soil moist because it's almost the same thing as you're soaking the seeds in the soil. Maybe it's a little bit faster to soak in water, but I don't have time sometimes. I just put them right in the soil and then they're ready to go. And now I will show you how I plant the seeds in the soil. Uh, so the soil that I use for germinating um, is a sterile soil. So that means there's no bacteria, fungus, nothing like wood or compost that could cause root rot or break down during the seeds growth. Um, so the acid mix, this is a sterile soil. Um, there are other types of soils that are sterile, usually not mixed together already. The acid mix is 50% peat moss and 50% pumice rock. And that is pretty much the perfect uh, medium for seed starting because it has a lot of oxygen with the rocks and then the peat moss holds plenty of moisture to keep the seeds um, hydrated. And um, other materials like vermiculite mixed with peat moss or 
perlite mixed with peat moss. Those are also sterile and safe to use. If you don't need like a lot, you just have a few little seeds to plant. Um, and it's always important. I like to make sure that I get the soil wet before I plant the seeds so that when I water it, the seeds don't float out or anything. Because sometimes peat moss, it takes a few waterings for the water to really penetrate the soil. And you don't want it to be super dry and then have things start floating out. So I'll show you how I plant. So there's a lot of different containers that you can use. I tend to pack it pretty firmly, not like super firm, but enough so that the soil, um, the seeds won't sink down into the soil when I water. And then um, when I do like large plantings, I fill up a whole tray of seed of packages. So they're easier to plant hundreds of seeds at a time. And when you water, you want to make sure that you use something that's not going to make everything spill out of the pot. So a seedling nozzle on the watering can, or if you are using the hose, you can use the like shower or the rain setting. And when you turn it on, turn it on away from the seedlings to make sure that it, it's coming out properly before you sprinkle it over. So like, like this watering can, it doesn't come out right the first time. So I'm gonna lightly go over without spilling over. There's no seeds in it yet. So if it does spill over, it's okay. Um, but you don't really want that to happen. So then um, when I first plant the soil in the pots, I watered a few times so that you know for sure it's saturated all the way through. And then when it starts coming out the bottom, you know that it, there's enough water in there. So I'll do one more time. Okay. So we've got our start. This is just soil in here. And then Let's say you want to plant some squash seeds. Right now is not the season to plant squash seeds, but I had some in my refrigerator because I harvested squash for pumpkin pie and I kept the seeds. So this is a squash seed. And if you're saving it, say you harvested it and you're saving it and storing it, you want to clean them so that they don't have any fruit left on them that could cause like some molding or fungus to start growing in the soil with it. So you wanna make sure that maybe you run them in warm water, let them sit for a little bit, and then dry them off on a paper towel and always let them dry out completely for a couple of days before you package them up to store them in a, in a bag or anything. So I'll take my squash seed. And I just take my finger, some people use like a chopstick or a pencil and poke a little hole. And then the squash seeds I plant flat sideways as well. And then I just pinch the soil back over it. And then the last thing I do is I fertilize with Osmocote. So Osmocote um, is a clean fertilizer and sterile. So that's why I also use that for seeds, um, any seed germinating, even cuttings, um, because it's just the pure elements um, and there's no chance of a bacteria or fungus kind of growing in the soil that could cause rot for the seed. So for like, these tiny cells, I would use maybe like five or six little pellets. They're very tiny, um, but I just kind of sprinkle them over the whole tray and they're not gonna burn if, unless you have like the whole entire thing covered with them. Just a few per cell is perfect for the seeds and enough to get them to start growing. Um, I will talk about the different types of fertilizers. So 
So after the seed has germinated and has grown and is well rooted and ready to transplant, after I transplant it into the ground or another pot, then I use like an organic fertilizer like Dr. Earth that has the mycorrhizae fungus in it already because that will help the roots grow. But it does take bacteria and fungus to break down organic nutrients to make it um, provide the, the elements that it needs. So. So organic versus synthetic. Organic is like a fish or poop or say seaweed, kelp. And in order for those to break down into like the needed nutrients, the NPK, which is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, it takes fungus or bacteria to break them break these down into these nutrients so it takes a little bit longer for the organics to start providing the nutrients the plants need but it is better in the long run because the fungus also helps the roots of the plant take up the nutrients synthetic is just the pure NPK or calcium, magnesium that the plant needs that has already been broken down um, and man-made, but in my opinion, it's more clean and safer to use for seeds so that no rotting can occur. That's a good question. So how big should your seeds be before you replant them? Um, when I see the roots coming out of the bottom of the plant or of the seed tray, that's usually a good sign that it's ready. Um, and when the, well, it depends on what kind of seed it is. But if it's a pumpkin or a squash, they're, they're pretty fast growing. Um, so definitely look for roots at the bottom um, and probably at least more than halfway the size of the, the uh, container that it's growing in. But I'd say to be safe, wait for the roots to come out the bottom. Um, and also, if you're growing them in the sun, like real sun, and not using a grow light, that's a little bit um, better for the seed. I've tried so many times in grow lights, so many times in natural sun, and natural sun is always the safest and best way because then the seeds are already acclimated to the light and you don't have to start them off in just a little bit of natural sun and worry about sunburn. So um, if you are using a grow light, I, I am using a grow light right now at my house because it's winter and I still want to grow. And so I set it for 12 hours, but it's a very strong, like 140 watt grow light, the LED uh, multicolor. And I have them pretty close. So the grow light is maybe at just less than two feet away from the actual seedlings. Um, Cause I've tried the, the, less stronger grow lights like the bars and the seeds had to be like right under there for them to get enough light so i've had a lot of trials and errors because you can tell when they're not getting enough light and the grow light isn't close enough or they're not getting enough natural sun the seeds will start to stretch toward the light and you want to prevent that because if they get too leggy then sometimes the first true leaves get too heavy and when you water them they'll just fall to the ground and get stuck and maybe rot out because 
They just don't have enough strength in their stem to hold themselves up. So that's why it's important if you do use a grow light to make sure it's strong enough. And when the seeds come out, they should be pretty short and before they get their new leaves on. If they're starting to just send out a stem and the leaves are still closed, that means that they're looking for light. So um, you know for sure you're getting enough light and from natural sun too, if the seeds, when they come up, the leaves come out right away and their stems are sturdy, they're not flopping over or anything. Did that answer? Okay. <laughs> Um, so the, oop, the pros for having the organic fertilizer after you plant the seedling into the ground or pot is the uh, mycorrhizae fungus. So the fungus has like a symbiotic relationship with the roots of the plants and they help the plant get its nutrients that have been breaking down from the bacteria and the fungus. Um, and then cons for using synthetic fertilizers all the time is it doesn't have the, the fungus or um, mycorrhizae that helps the roots in the long run. So it does provide nutrients right away, which is, which is a pro, um, enough for it to start and get going. But in the long run, it's better to feed the soil with enough bacteria and fungus that will keep the plant growing for, for a long time. So yeah, this one. The, the pro is instant instant nutrition. Um, well, no, the Dr. Earth, yeah, the, or, the Dr. Earth is the organic, so it takes like a few weeks for it to break down and actually provide the nutrients that the plants need but it is better in the long run for when you want them to grow into a big, a bigger plant. And then this one, we always use it when we first plant our plants because in our soil, like the top pot or the acid mix, there's no nutrients or fungus in there already, it's sterile. So this will provide the nutrients instantly, but then once it gets into the ground, well, there's already fungus in the ground so you don't really need to add anything. But if you're keeping something in a pot, that's why it's important to add the mycorrhizae to help the root system grow bigger and better and stronger. So I always use these two hand in hand. Okay. Any questions about fertilizing? No? Okay. Um, next we'll, well, um, after you fertilize the plant, you always want to make sure that in your seedling trays they stay wet or moist. Um, you don't want them to dry out at all because then that could stunt the roots and prevent it from growing. Um, and you do have to be very careful if you're using a grow light, they do dry out really fast. So sometimes when I'm growing um, under a grow light, then I have um, like a humidity dome underneath and also a tray that catches the water. So this grow tray, it doesn't have any holes in it. So if I water it, the water will sit in there. Um, you just want to be careful if there's too much water, it could start to overflow. And if the water is all the way at the top, that could potentially um, pre prevent the oxygen from flowing within the seed tray. So that's another important thing that they need is oxygen um, when they're growing too, so they don't rot out. So always, if you water in a 
tray that has no drainage to make sure that you either pour it out if there's too much um, or just be careful when you water don't over water don't let the plants sit in like all the way up to their tops <laughs> of water um, and if you're just growing like one little pot like a mango seed then I put a saucer underneath and that's easy to empty out if it's too full but um, you don't really have to worry about too much water and the seed uh, the tray because it's so short that usually soaks it up right away and so it's always a good backup too if you're not able to water every day to have a tray as a backup like reservoir for the soil to suck up another important very important thing to do is always label your seeds and the date when you plant them because if you plant a lot then you might forget and forget their needs. Um, so I like to use just little stick labels um, because they don't uh, fade or disintegrate. And the wax pins, or you can even use a crayon or pencil because these don't fade in the sun like Sharpie does. Um, so I write for the mango seed, I'll write mango and then this is a valencia pride mango seedling pride seedling and then the date is 12 30. so it's hard to write without being on a surface but <laughs> that's what it looks like and and i keep the label out of the way so that the seed can grow and now I won't forget what I planted because <laughs> sometimes some seeds take longer to germinate and if it's just sitting there for a long time you're like oh it might be dead and you throw it away but really it just needed more time so um, that's another reason to always label your plants Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't tried using sandpaper on the seed, the squash seeds, but since they are pretty like glossy, it doesn't hurt. I'm sure that would help it go faster because you wouldn't hurt it if you just do the edges of the seed and scratch it. That will help it. Um, soak up the water faster yeah yeah you can always experiment sometimes I like if I have like hard seeds with a thick coating half of them I'll nick with a knife and then half of them I'll just leave and then I'll like mark them and see which grew faster and if it's even needed so if you ever do like a lot of plantings you can experiment and find out and then share the knowledge with everyone else <laughs> Um, oh, this is a fun one that um, I planted from seed from a fruit of a house plant. This house plant is a philodendron. It's called the Monstera deliciosa, and that's a split leaf philodendron with the big leaves. And earlier this spring, um, our fruit, our plants made big giant fruits that kind of taste like a pineapple flower. Um, flowery flavor and this one had like 17 seeds in it so I was excited and they uh, look kind of like little green beans and they don't stay viable for very long so that's why it's hard to buy them online because they have to be kept humid or in a moist environment or else if they dry out then they're not viable anymore so it's always fun to experiment like if your house plant makes a fruit and you can plant it. And the reason I like to do that is because you never know what you're going to get. Sometimes like they could be shaped differently than the mother plant that it came from or have a different color to them, um, just grow differently. But usually like for our house plants, they're pretty true to the seed. Would you like a seed? Okay. <laughs> 
Um, so that's a fun one. These little babies will soon become big, giant, split-leaf philodendrons. And this one, I wrote the date. Um, these seeds are started in October, mid-October. So it took a few months, but it was kind of cooling down. I had them in our greenhouse in like partial sun, so they didn't germinate as quickly as like if they're in full sun probably. I've had some of them like sprout in just three days after I planted them at my house because my tiny greenhouse warms up really quickly. So heat for tropicals is very important. Um, for germinating, if you have vegetables or fruit trees that like a lot of heat, like tomatoes and peppers, peppers especially, you need to use a heat mat if you're going to plant them before their growing season, like maybe February, January, February, if you want to start your pepper seeds for the springtime, then it's not warm enough outside. Um, if I was starting the seeds outside, I would have a heat mat during the nighttime. Um, it's important to use a timer or a thermostat like control for the heat mats because I've experienced just leaving the heat mat on all the time and with the sun or a grow light and it just melted everything. <laughs> it was too hot when it was both the heat mat and the grow light at the same time. So it's better to have the heat mat going at night so they stay warm because um, the heat mats are usually 75, 80 degrees, which is the perfect temperature that's needed. Um, or if it's in full sun, use the thermometer timer. They have like a controller that you can plug your heat mats in with a thermometer attached so that when it gets a certain temperature, the heat mat turns off or it turns on if it's cold. So that's what I have outside because you can't really tell when it's gonna get hot, if it's like a gloomy day or sunny day. So that's when those come in handy. Um, and you don't need to use a heat mat for everything like squash veggies, brassica, um, which is broccoli, sprouts, um, herbs, tomatoes are pretty fast without a heat mat. So um, that does like, it boosts the, their germination to grow faster, but it's not needed if you start them like in the right season, like spring, early March, then you should be fine with that. Um, are there any certain seeds that anyone has had trouble germinating and has questions about? No? Everyone's a Yes. Um, those seeds, they are tropical uh, spinach. So the Malabar spinach, usually April, April, May, or if you wanted to start them indoors by a sunny window, then they should grow because they do grow like as a house plant in some areas when it's cold outside, then the, the house heat is enough to get them started. Not all seeds. Um, so the question is, should all seeds be refrigerated um, to store them? Um, you can, with like tomatoes, vegetables, herbs, um, prolong their life in the refrigerator because it's cool. You just want to make sure to maybe put like a silicon packet in with them or to keep them dry so that they don't rot inside the fridge. Um, but tropical seeds like mangoes and the, the Malabar spinach, they don't like the cold, so I wouldn't put them in the refrigerator, but just like a dark, cool space. Um, and then the mango seeds you want to plant right away. You don't want to store them because they might not survive. Mike? Microgreens are pretty fast. Um, it doesn't hurt to start them in like warm water if you want them to germinate faster. Um, and the brighter the light is, the faster they'll germinate. But even, I guess it doesn't matter if, because you're not going to grow them to be a big plant. So if they do get a little leggy, that's okay. Um, but 
they might taste better if they have more light nutrients. Usually the sunlight helps them become sweeter. And if it's darker, they might be a little more bitter. Um, it's good to change out the water if you are soaking them in water so that it's not sitting and doesn't like just in case the seeds aren't super sterile or cleaned. Um, you don't want anything to grow in there like mold. So I know like when I did microgreens, um, oh, I did sprouts in a sprout tray. I had the water below and then would mist them. But in microgreens, um, if you're starting it in like a tray like this with no holes at the bottom, then you just want to be very careful not to overwater, but keep it moist. So maybe use like a mister or a spritzer to just get the water like on the surface, maybe halfway down, um, just so that the roots get enough oxygen and don't sit in the water because you don't want it to become um, like stagnant at the bottom or else, yeah, it could cause root rot. Yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, if you don't already know for the research, how could you tell if it's new to That's a good question. Um, usually it is good to research um, if you want to plant that type of seed, how to store it or treat it. Um, some, like the mango is kind of, it's hard to explain, but like if you see that it's like a very fleshy seed, um, kind of like the, the monstera, it looked like a green bean but then when they shrivel, they just turn into like a black little raisin and then it looks like it's dead. <laughs> so you just kind of, I, I would research just to be safe. Um, Cause yeah, some. Really tell necessarily by looking at it, at picking out a characteristic that it's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's yeah, because if it looks really fleshy, I guess, then that means you don't want it to dry out. Because, um, like, tomato seeds and broccoli seeds, they're usually pretty dry when you harvest them. Um, that's another thing I wanted to show everyone is um, when you're harvesting, you want to make sure that it's ripe. If you want to, like, say you really liked the broccoli that you grew, um, this one, this broccoli I'm growing in my house, and every time I cut the head off, it just makes more heads. Um, but this one was from summertime, so it got too hot and it bolted. And that's what it looks like when it bolts. Um, it just goes to flower and starts to make seeds. So this obviously is not ready because the seeds haven't formed, but this one, is close to being ready. Um, I would wait. I didn't have any that were turning brown or drying out, but on the broccoli seeds, you can see the seed pod is pretty thick now. And usually when they turn brown right before they split open and spread everywhere is when you want to harvest them um, because then you know they are fully developed inside their little seed pod. Um, so if you want to take a look at that, can pass that around. Um, same with some herbs that some people, like this is fennel. This is also growing in my yard. And the fennel, a lot of people like to use the little flower buds um, before they dry out because it makes a good tea. Um, like at this stage, they're very licorice flavored and they are used uh, like for medicinal teas and other purposes. Um, and then this is this from the same plant, but this is them dried out. And you can tell the difference. This one looks dead, but <laughs> all the babies have been dried out and they're um, ready to harvest. 
so you can save those in a package and not worry about them rotting or anything because they're completely dry. Um, so that's another thing to look for when you're harvesting your plants and you want to save the seeds, make sure that they're fully developed. Um, same with like pepper seeds. Thank you. Um, like peppers, some people like to eat them when they're green, like green bell peppers, but usually when they're fully ripe, they turn red. So if you want to save that pepper again, you want to keep it on the plant until it's fully red and then you know for sure that the seeds inside are fully developed. Um, well, yeah, I think this one has flowered already and then these are the little seeds, but they're still green. Yeah, and fleshy. If the seed has mold on it, then it's probably not safe to use, save that one just to be, yeah, I don't know. You could try that. Just try soaking in alcohol to um, kill off any mold. It, but I would just, if you have a lot of seeds, then just save the clean ones. <laughs> because, yeah, you don't want to go through too much trouble cleaning seeds if they make hundreds already. Um, another reason to save seeds for, like, say, if you have some type of vegetable that you really like. Um, well, this one, I didn't save the seeds, but I grew an Aiko tomato, which is a Japanese grape tomato, last year. And then this spring, um, or late in the summer, it came back in the same spot from a seed, I'm guessing, <laughs> because they look very similar, but they're larger, almost like a Roma tomato. So since that one is a hybrid, um, it could have been maybe uh, have a, it could have had a parent like aroma tomato. That's why they're so meaty inside, but they're super sweet. And my son, who's three, just eats them like candy. Like he makes me chop them up for him because he loves them so much. I'm like, well, that's good. <laughs> but um, we, yeah, so if you want to save, like this is a really good fruit and I want to save it. So I make sure that at least one fruit, I will let it fully ripen. And then I take the seeds and spread them out on a little paper towel, just like one of these, and let them dry out. And then you can wash them. I never do because I'm lazy, but you should. <laughs> Maybe wash them with water and then dry them again. Um, but I just save them and grow them the next year and hope that they will be just as good as the parent. Um, saving seeds, you never really know what you're going to get unless it's like an heirloom seed. Um, heirloom seeds are true to seed um, and they are saved and passed down generation to generation because of their qualities that they have, like excellent flavor or vigorous growth, um, and they're just fun to save. Um, but then there's hybrid seeds, which if you grow and you save a seed from a hybrid seed, it could be anything from one parent or a different parent. Um, an example would be, let me see if I have anything, maybe like a purple jalapeno. They have purple jalapenos, yellow jalapenos, but like the true jalapeno, it starts green and then turns red. And then the hybrids, they cross with like maybe a purple bell pepper. Um, so one parent is a purple bell and one parent is a green jalapeno. And when they cross pollinate those flowers um, um, on purpose, then they get the fruit that they're looking for, which is a purple jalapeno. So if you take a seed from a hybrid, it could be, it could turn into a bell pepper or it could turn into a jalapeno. So it's kind of a mystery and a risk 
if you are expecting <laughs> the same exact fruit that you planted from the hybrid seed, um, it might be a mystery. It's kind of like humans. Like, for example, my husband and I, we have two sons. One son has brown eyes, just like me. And then my other son has blue eyes, just like my husband. And yeah, so you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> but one is like one parent, one is like the other, or sometimes they're a perfect mix of both. Any questions on hybrid? Um, uh huh. What is your thought on? Uh, I've heard people talk about tomato seeds, and they're saying them. You keep out seeds with the gel stick around it, a little bit of water in it, but a stick or several days before you rinse them and dry the soil, as opposed to taking them out and drying them, drying them immediately. That's usually what I do is I just dry them immediately and store the tomato seeds. But um, I guess if this, uh, the juice from the tomato is slightly acidic, that maybe helps start the process of um, breaking the seed coat. Yeah, sure. but I'm not 100% sure. So <laughs> I would research that. I just experiment and dry them out and sometimes I don't have enough time to thoroughly wash them but I just have so many that if one rots out then there's still hundreds more <laughs> so yeah just kind of gotta experiment or do the research and find out too um oh also I wanted to mention genetically modified seeds because there are always questions about, oh, are these seeds GMO or not? If any nursery retailer had GMO seeds, they would have to label it, and it would be very, very expensive since they're man-made. Um, so it's hard to find GMO seeds through retail nurseries. Usually it's just for farmers, for like soy and wheat. Um, and some GMOs, well, usually are just to uh, modify or um, change the seed to prevent it from getting certain diseases or resisting drought. Um, like, for example, the citrus greening disease that is killing a lot of citrus. Um, it's, they're having a really bad time in Florida because all the, all the citrus trees are grafted onto rootstocks and, and have been the same trees um, from cuttings or grafts for many decades. And without the seed variation, then the diseases can attack all those same trees that have been growing for forever. So like the citrus greening disease kills most of the citrus trees. And the reason why you want seed variation is so that you can find these citrus trees that are resilient to that disease and don't die. Um, and so that's why now the citrus industry is starting to grow citrus from seeds to see which ones can tolerate and survive from that disease before it wipes out all the citrus that we do have. Um, and I'm not too worried. Um, I have probably like 20 citrus trees in my house. And I don't know, I guess, well, I have like a finger lime and those are one that are resistant to the disease, the citrus green, greening disease. Um, and then apparently Washington navels, they can get it, but it doesn't give them like symptoms. It doesn't prevent the nutrients like in most citrus trees from flowing throughout the tree. Um, another one is like banana trees. Bananas used to be grown from seed and then they've been developed for so long to get rid of the seeds so that when we eat a banana, we're not munching on crunchy seeds. Um, but the, I think it was the Grossmichael banana tree. Um, started getting a rot disease that was wiping out the plantations. And that's when they started, they like were scrambling for seeds in the banana, which is very hard to find now, to plant new varieties that were um, resilient to that disease that was killing them off. 
So that is another important um, reason to save your seeds so that we have varieties um, and hardiness towards those diseases and bad things. <laughs> so that, yeah, we just have all our fruits and we don't let them go extinct. Um, yeah. Any questions on that? Right, right, yeah. So like the tree, the orange tree that I have is, I think, because it came with the house, but we think it's a Trovita orange, which is a seedling grown from a Washington maple. So my tree, some, like, I'll get like one in every 50 fruit will have like a navel on it, like a little belly button. And so that's why I think it's a, from a Washington navel, but not all the fruit are like that. Um, so it's fun to see what you get. I've, I'm growing like seeds from a lemon tree, from a lime tree, from all different sorts of tr like citrus trees, but I know that when they grow, it's going to be a mystery because the citrus are so crossed between each other that the parents and the babies are always different. So I might get an orange from my Meyer lemon because it is part orange in its ancestry. <laughs> so. That's another fun way to experiment, but um, like my Kalamondon tree, I waited about seven, eight years from seed, and it finally got three fruits on it, and they are like Kalamondons, the same. So that one's pretty true to seed, but um, I did grow like um, some pomelo hybrid from a seed probably about five or six years ago, and I'm still waiting to see what comes out. So that's always fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, did I cover everything? I think. Um, yeah. Any questions? Um, I've heard people who have stayed seed for many years, sometimes maybe 10 or more years, and the seed is still viable, sometimes they're not. Right. Does that depend on the type of seed it is, or is it storage conditions, or both, or neither? I think both. Um, like, for example, squash and pumpkin seeds can last supposedly hundreds of years if kept in the right conditions, like a cool, um, dry, dark area. Um, but ones that don't last as long, I think, are like tomato seeds or I know for sure onion seeds. Um, yeah, you just kind of have to research. There are charts online that say the viability um, approximate viability of the seeds because um, like again you can refrigerate or freeze some seeds and just keep them going longer that way but you have to be careful that they like that condition make sure they like that it, yeah most likely like the tropical seeds mm -hmm. although I did have a customer bring me a white sapote fruit that they said they got from Hawaii and they had the fruits in the freezer for a year or more. And they brought me the fruit, the, did they bring me the fruit? I think it was the fruit or the seed. And I grew it and it grew. So that specific plant can be frozen. <laughs> you just have to experiment, I guess, and see what comes out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's kind of confusing. Like when the plants are labeled non GMO, all the plants at the nursery are non GMO. Um, maybe one exception would be papaya trees. Um, there is another virus killing off papaya trees. Um, and I think it's big in Hawaii. And what scientists have done is they took the virus that has been killing it. Um, I guess the genes from the virus and then they killed it and then they killed the virus and then put it into the seed of the papaya tree just kind of like our vaccinations is how they vaccinate people so then we know that that virus we can be resilient to <laughs> 
which is kind of interesting that it worked for papaya trees. And then I think if you grow that seed, then the resilience stays in the babies, but I'm not 100% sure, so I would research that. But I don't think it's that bad if, if it's just that, or it's not like changing anything dramatically, just trying to keep them alive. Okay. Well, yeah. So, say you eat them, that means they have an avocado seed. And you grow a specific kind of root for the seed. Growing an avocado from seed, it usually varies with the tree, you never know. But I've had some avocado fruit from seed after about three years. So, and that's same with mango trees too, about three years is some, it just depends, yeah, on the seed. I don't know if there's any way you can um, trick it into fruiting faster um, besides just grafting on a different variety already growing onto the seedling. But from seedling, it's fun because that's how you discover new varieties that are interesting. like the reed and the holiday and Don Gilligley. Um, you can make your own variety of avocado if it's something really special and unique that you grew from seed. You can name it after yourself or something. <laughs> yeah, so that's what I like to do. I save all my seeds and I have avocado seeds coming up everywhere in my yard because I just throw them out into the yard and they grow. <laughs> and yeah. Um, not, not really. I mean, if the seed is bigger, then it's probably stronger and more vigorous. It will have like a sturdier plant that comes out of it, but I don't think it will, um, decipher what the flavor of the fruit is going to be. But, Right. Yeah, if it's... Yeah, usually like when we get our seedling rootstocks, they're the big uh, Mexican seed avocados, Zutano. Um, I have Mexicola, which is a really big seeded um, fruit. So when you plant that seed, that's really extra large and sturdy the tree that comes out is usually extra large and sturdy but then if you want fruit that doesn't have a huge seed in it that's why they graft the varieties onto that so that the bottom seed you have that vigorous growth but the top you have the quality tree that you want Does that apply to other trees? i think so yep which it probably does but I haven't done all that myself, so I'll have to experiment one day. <laughs> okay, thank you for coming to my class. And yeah, if you have any questions, feel free. I'm here all day. <laughs>